welcome to ELT CPD's first podcast. My name's Billy and I'll be your host. Let me start by telling you a little bit about ELT CPD, how it got started and what you can expect to hear in the series. So ELT CPD has been around for the last couple of years, mainly as an idea, but also as blog posts, as webinars and as discussions with experts, teachers and publishing professionals in the English language industry. The purpose of the ELT CPD podcast is to talk about all things English, so from teaching learners in the classroom, to writing materials, to editing, to publishing, so no areas are off limits. We've done lots of research to see the kind of things people said that they'd like to hear about, so we'll be focusing on those topics initially, such as diversity and inclusion in both the classroom and publishing, and then we'll move on to more career-focused discussions such as how to go from teaching to writing materials or editing, for example. As the series progresses, we'll be using your ideas and suggestions to talk about all things ELT. If you do have any ideas for things you'd like to hear or learn about, please do feel free to get in touch at info at eltcpd.com and we'll also be asking you to send in any questions you may have on any of our upcoming shows, which we'll put a call out for shortly. So now we've done some introductions, we're going to be starting our first podcast with a mini series focusing on diversity and inclusion. And I'm so excited to introduce our first guest who's going to be talking to us about special educational needs in the classroom and in materials, Laura Broadbent. So welcome to the show, Laura. Hi there, thank you for having me. It's uh, great to be here with you. Thanks very much for coming today. How are you? Good, thanks, good. We're uh, just coming to the end of our lockdown too at the moment there. Uh, and uh, so it's um, looking forward to going outside again. Oh my gosh, yes, me too, completely. <laughs> okay, so um, let's start maybe by you telling us a little bit about yourself, so who you are, what you do, and your background. Yeah, of course. So my name is uh, Laura Broadbent. Um, as you can hear, I'm from England, um, but I taught uh, English abroad probably uh, from the age of 22-ish um, in various different countries. And then while I was in Spain, I started um, becoming a materials writer, um, thanks to a friend's uh, recommendation. And so then started initially just translating um, school books, so for one of the Spanish publishers. Um, and then fortunately for me, um, the uh, original books ran out, so um, they needed um, them to be written from scratch. So I started writing them from there, and that was about seven years ago. And since then I've been writing uh, freelance, and as well as that, I also um, volunteer as a speech and language therapist assistant both at a deaf school in Brighton and also with an organisation that um, supports people after they've had strokes. Um, so I do, obviously not this year so much, but, but I do both of those weekly as well on top of the writing. Perfect. So you've got really, really vast background in special educational needs then and um, you've worked with, did you work with SEND learners in the classroom as well? Or... I did. Um, in fact, I think probably all teachers do without necessarily realising it. Um, I um, initially, I remember a couple of students I had when I was teaching in Brighton were, and I think most teachers will appreciate this, um, you arrive in a class, um, particularly the summer camp schools, and you've got no idea what students you've got, you've been given zero warning, you just get told what you have to teach, um, and you arrive in the class and then you very quickly see that there are some students who um, certainly require slightly different attention um, than others. And then you think, oh my gosh, um, you don't really have the chance to find out what the issue is um, because there's just simply no time. Um, and so I definitely had some students who were that happened to. So I couldn't tell you um, what obstacles they had, um, or, you know, if they had any diagnosis or anything. But I can certainly tell you um, the difficulties they had in class. So did you have um, an awareness of special educational needs before you stepped into the classroom? Or was that your first sort of experience you had to learn no, as you were teaching? It, no, I didn't at all. So I had absolutely no idea. When I went into teaching, absolutely no idea about SNF learners um, and absolutely no preparation. Um, and interestingly enough, it really came to a, uh, into my realisation or my conscience, really, 
when my husband started learning English. Oh, okay. um, and so that would have been when we moved back to England uh, five years ago now. Um, he started going to uh, English language classes at, at a typical uh, English language school in Brighton, which is swamped with them, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, and he would go, I mean, first of all, his um, feelings of learning were very negative. He wasn't looking forward to even starting because he um, believed that he couldn't learn um, and he was pretty stupid and left school without any qualifications in Brazil. Um, but then he started uh, coming back and really, really didn't want to go back to class each day. And it was really, really a battle for him. Um, I think it was definitely a battle between us as well. Um, <laughs> to try and get him to go back. I realised that when he was talking to me, he would, <clears throat> in his first language, which was Portuguese, um, he would mix up the days days of the week or the months of the year okay. um, and he didn't know the order of them and so then I thought oh wait a minute this this I've heard that this you know these sequencing uh, problems can be related to dyslexia anyway so we went to uh, spoke to my um, aunt who's secondary school teacher although she also says they have no formal training at all for SEM students and so she suggested, you know, just uh, trying a couple of other things with him. Um, anyway, and so we decided to uh, take him for a dyslexia test. Um, I've been to a couple of webinars recently and then talking about the resources for all SEN students. They were talking particularly about dyslexia um, across Europe. So they were comparing Turkey, Spain, uh, a couple of Scandinavian countries and the UK. Okay. And all of them um, essentially came up with, you know, many students are, are not um, given an assessment until the beginning of secondary school because they like to wait to see if these, you know, some of the obstacles iron out and it's, you know, it's just a, you know, it's maybe some other reason that it's happening, um, which then of course exacerbates the problem, you know, when there is a problem. And lots of students leave school without being diagnosed. Okay. So in the UK, at least, obviously, if you're at school, the, di uh, the assessment is free because it's part of the education system. However, when you're an adult and you pay to do it, it costs us £800. Oh, my so goodness. So it's, yes, it's something that's not accessible um, to lots of people. So you um, have so to get it done at school, more or less. But I guess some, some countries don't have that. Actually, oh, really yeah, do, exactly. So. Um, lots of countries definitely don't have that um, those resources to do them because the assessment took four between four to five hours. Oh my gosh! Um, yes, and then it took the set the assessor, I think, nearly a week to write up the report, and it was a thick wad mm -hmm. report. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it was a huge document. Um, so yes. For schools and educational systems to have these resources is, is not easy. So as well as dyslexia, what else does special educational needs encompass? What, what other things might, might there be? A huge, a huge uh, fan of uh, different needs. So you begin with, of course, you'll have uh, students maybe with you know different physical abilities. You'll have possibly students um, with uh, visual processing impairments, maybe hearing impairments. Um, and then, you you know, you'll have kind of the more neurally diverse. So you might have dyscalculia, dyspraxia, dyslexia. And all of these are essentially a point with the processing um, ability of the brain. So this might be with numbers. It might be with patterns. It might be with uh, writing. So at your, your motor processing, so obviously your ability to hold a pen or a pencil and write um, neatly um, or just at least so it's understandable. You might have ADHD, so obviously people who don't have a long attention span. Um, so all of these things don't quite sit with a traditional educational environment. So you mentioned um, processing information. Um, of course, special educational needs, as you said, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia. 
this may be quite a broad question, but are there any activities or things that teachers should consider in the classroom to help students who maybe need help with processing information or or um, any activities you can think of that people should consider? So I think, fortunately, there are lots of options. Uh, the, the main idea is, with all of these processing abilities and types, is that it's the trying to get uh, the, the information in through the processing memory to then be able to put into the long-term memory. Um, so a lot of, so for example, with dyslexia, the long-term memory is incredibly good. Mm -hmm. And actually, it can often be a lot stronger than uh, students without dyslexia. However, the issue comes with, it's just basically moving the uh, information through that processing, uh, the, the processing memory into the long-term memory. So, um, and that's why you'll often get um, stu some students, particularly uh, with dyslexia or <laughs> other things that are able to think incredibly laterally because they can remember things from completely other, you know, different situations and connect them to the classroom. Uh, information, which is fantastic, but to have um, activities to help you get through the processing memory, the one thing is variation or variety is the key. So where where you can have kinesthetic um, learning, so moving, having them you know move around. Let's say for example, uh, you might have one student. I'm a verb, and have another student. I'm an adjective, and have another student. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a subject, um, and they stand in the order that they appear. Uh, in a sentence, then you can say now stands in the order for a question, and you know they move around. Um, so that's one way of doing it. And then also um, you can either do color coding. Obviously, this is for people who are able to see colors easily. Um, so color coding, for example, you can have types of words. Um, again, you know your verb or your adjective color coding. Um, you can also all categorizing in any way. So that might be writing something in bold or writing something in pencil, um, you know, having the different words like that. A really good idea also is, so let's say, for example, you um, you say, oh, compare the plastic bottle with the metal bottle. Um, tell me the differences and the similarities, which not only is obviously, you know, part of learning grammatical um, comparison structures, but it's also a, a skill that you'll see in lots of um, English exams, you know, where you have to compare photos in the speaking exam. And so maybe like. using sort of realia in the classroom might help just to, to give them something visual, maybe? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, for example, a Venn diagram, so where mm -hmm. you've got the overlapping circles. Um, so they're putting obviously the different information uh, in the separate parts of the circle and then the overlapping part, they put similarities. Um, mind maps, but these mind maps can be anything. They can be in pyramid shapes. They can be, um, they can be, you know, for example, like you see the, what's it called? The, um, I'm not sure what it's called these days. Food circle, the food plate, you know, with oh, the yeah. balanced mm -hmm. diet recommendation. <laughs> yeah. The eat well plate. Yeah. And also another great thing is, obviously, you know, sometimes you can have uh, make 3D shapes. Mm. So you, you, you know, you'll give a student a template of, let's say, a net of, of a cube. And so let's say, for example, you said, OK, so um, tell me six things, uh, research, I don't know, uh, Simone Lee Biles, and then tell me six things about her. Mm -hmm. So for some students, writing a list of information is very difficult. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they don't have the information. It simply means for them the ability to produce that information is their strengths in other places. Yes, exactly. So if you ask them to put the cube together, which I personally... I find incredibly difficult because mm -hmm. I, that's not my strength at all. If you, yeah. But if you ask me to write a paragraph talking about someone, no problems. Um, but let's say, for example, you gave to my husband who's dyslexic, the cube, oh, he'll do it in seconds. Mm -hmm. And then he'll write the information, short bits of information on the cube, and then could show you the cube. Yeah. It's exactly the same. Uh, you're requiring the same processing skills in the brain, and they have the same information. They're just, just um, giving one, it, yeah. you know in other ways. So, and also speaking. Um, so another really good thing, this can work both ways, is when you pair your students together, pair different strengths together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might have a student who is not confident at speaking and one who is confident. Not only does it mean that together they can complete a task well, they share the skills. So mm -hmm. they learn to respect other people's skills and realize that, okay, they might be good at one thing, 
but everyone else is good at something else as well. Yeah, so exactly. it, it, it helps build that respect in between your class, which ideally as a teacher you want because it's going to make your life easier. Yeah, it's <laughs> really, really important. Yeah, and just build relationships between students and understand that not everyone mm -hmm. learns in exactly the same way. Um, so Absolutely. What would you say to in regards to teachers who maybe have a more traditional style of teaching, maybe have res restricted space in their classroom, and sort of forced to, to take a more heads down approach and maybe do go for gap fill activities or matching activities on paper. Is there anything that teachers can do to accommodate or is there anything that, that should be considered perhaps? What I often found was very um, successful in the class um, when you do have, let's say, gap fills. Let's say gap fills as an example. Rather than giving students a gap fill to fill in, they actually create the gap film mm -hmm. um, for each other. And that's the process of creating it. So, for example, uh, write a sentence about today. Today I am going swimming in the afternoon. Okay. Um, and then, you know, you could pass, pass that piece of paper onto the left. Okay, now take out the verbs. Um, so they erase the verbs. You know, and it goes around. So not only do they then, are they using the different skills and looking at uh, these things from a different perspective, it actually uh, reduces the teacher's work yeah. um, and helps uh, students understand what's actually being asked of them. Because a lot of the time, you'll, you, particularly in exams, because of the pressure, uh, neurodiverse students will, let's say, look at a question. And I had some students, they would say to me, OK, I understand every single word in this question, but I don't understand what I have to do. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what it's asking me to do. This will affect every part of your life, yeah. you know, whether you're getting instructions from a colleague or, you know, being told what to do. So by having students create these activities themselves, they learn what they're being asked to do because they're actually creating it themselves. That's and you can do this with, you know, many different types of um, activities. Of course, yes, you'll have, at least with those type of activities, all you need is a rubber, a pencil and a piece of paper. So would you um, say that it's courage moving? Yeah, I was, sorry, I was going to say, would you say that it's less preparation for the teacher? Or would you say that it's more in the fact that they, they have to sort of read through all of the material, the lesson essentially in the course that they're going to teach and sort of figure out how they can adapt if and they're, if they're going to adapt and, if, and how they're going to adapt? Absolutely. I mean, on the one hand, and it's like lots of things, isn't it? Uh, at the beginning, it will be more work. Mm -hmm. But once you've, once you've learned how to, uh, let's say, for example, you know, okay, I'm going to make them do a gap fill with the, vo uh, with the vocabulary we've learned today. So what, what you'll actually be able to do very quickly is say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll just use the text that's in the textbook, and students can copy down different parts of it and then write their own version. So mm -hmm. then you learn um, how to do that in the long run very quickly. So I think another really key thing when uh, preparing materials is the value of reflection, because I think one thing that uh, teachers can often struggle with is the differences in your classes, you, mm -hmm. know, you know, whether that might be a different, your different A1, you know, to C1 levels, you might think, oh gosh, especially as, you know, relatively new teachers, oh my gosh, I have to think of a completely new class. Whereas actually, if you have students reflect, so for example, asking questions is the best way not only to become independent learner, not only to understand your own strengths and weaknesses and those of others, but also your 21st century skills. So, you know, after you create your, you, or you have students create your gap fill activity, and then they do it, and then, you know, just say, okay, what did you find hard? What did you find difficult? These questions don't need to be hard. Yeah. Um, you know, complicated. And the answers don't, you know, you could even do yes, no, you know, questions. Was this difficult? Yes. Was this difficult? Okay. No. So then you know for the future from that specific class, this works and this doesn't. Or these learners, these people in the class like this. Um, and then that's, you know, it's a really useful way of, uh, doing it also you know for example flashcards you know everyone loves flashcards students make their own um they don't need to always you know some students oh i hate drawing yeah but some students also hate you know writing yeah and it's funny how you know you you know i gave a webinar a while ago and i said oh you know have your students draw as well 
and uh, someone said, yeah, but some students hate drawing. And I'm thinking, yes. yes. You can't please everyone. <laughs> writing. Yeah. And they're always forced to write. Definitely. So, and you know, I'm awful at drawing. And my students used to love it when I tried to draw on the uh, board. It was all stick, <laughs> stick people. But, you know, they generally got the idea. And if they didn't, they were much more engaged than if I told them to read a sentence. Definitely. So I think, so all of these things can, you know, build up. Um, to helping the teacher be creative. And I guess once the teacher becomes more accustomed to sort of incorporating all of these activities into their lessons, it'll become second nature really, you know, they'll sort of maybe plan for the first time, see what worked, what didn't work, and then um, sort of alter their plan according to that. And um, you made an interesting point about yes or no questions, because I think when teachers um, are taught to teach in an ELT classroom, they're always asked to open sort of to ask yeah open questions or concept mm. checking questions we're not mm. sort of asked to to say do you understand but would you say that those sorts of questions are, are crucial in a in a classroom with students with special educational needs i think basically i would think it's the balance of if a student is not comfortable or confident in answering um, in front of the class, mm -hmm. uh, yes or no is better than nothing. So how would um, you work that in sort of an online classroom? Would you would you direct message the student? Would you go to a chat box? Or, or how would you prefer to do that? It's funny because online classes can go both ways. They can actually work really in favour of some SEN students because they're not scared in front of uh, the classroom, yeah. you know, they're not, so actually, and you know, their ability to type, and particularly if they've got maybe software that helps them, you might find that they're stronger mm -hmm. online, okay. um, so they might not actually, the yes, no questions might not be necessary. Okay. Um, moving on yeah. to materials writing, because I know you write a lot of materials um, for SEM learners as well, so is there anything that material writers should consider or maybe don't think about at all? Um, just just from your classroom experience of using course books and as a materials writer yourself as well. I'm going to start with a, a, a personal opinion um, and then I'll carry on about uh, materials writing. Now, a personal thing that I found when I was teaching that I have uh, made a change in the materials I write now. I know not everyone agrees, but my personal opinion is that you will often see, particularly in traditional course books, the grammar explanations, they say, uh, in English, we use going to for the future. Mm -hmm. And just the small use of we separates the English speaker from the non-English speaker or the English learner. Yeah. Now, I know some people will actually say, no, we're using we as all encompassing everyone. Mm -hmm. um, however, I found as a teacher, I didn't read it that way. So therefore, I'm assuming there will be other teachers who also, and learners, who don't read it that way. Yeah. So I, first of all, I would propose taking the we out. So what would you use instead? Nothing. So okay. I would say, which also then makes it simpler. So maybe something really? like use the exactly. third person when, da, 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 for example. Exactly. In English, use going okay. to, to talk about future plans. Yeah. Not only are you actually making it easier because there's less words in the sentence, mm -hmm. so the we is actually redundant. Okay. Um, I, that's my first point. Okay. Um, so then, going on from there, certainly with grammar explanations, uh, I would bullet point them as much as possible and make them as short as possible okay. um so let's say for example <clears throat> to indicate uh prohibition use x to indicate obligation in this context use x so using it as uh, bullet points rather than long paragraphs mm -hmm. and makes it more accessible suggesting and i know when your material is writing you're not necessarily designing but you often make suggestions for the way um, information is presented. So using infographics, using the Venn diagrams, using timelines, yeah. using mind maps, using that to present information because then that not only is easier for, and this is not just neurodiverse students, this is all students. It's much easier to absorb the information and then inspires them to reproduce that information uh, in a, a variety of ways as well. If possible, have students 
when they, let's say, watch a video, mm -hmm. have them respond to the video before you analyze the video or text. Um, let's go for text because it's a bit more traditional, although videos are probably a bit more up to date. Either would, way. Would that be to um, check understanding first or? So, for example, uh, let's say in the story, um, the, the video's showing uh, a, visit, a tourist visit to the United States. Yeah. And, you know, they go around X places, they try whatever food, whatever. So have students first respond, oh, would you try that food? Um, or would you go there? Why, why not? You know, what do you think of the United States? React to it first. And then also, uh, let's say, for example, choose one point or one scene in that text or video and now tell your partner what you can smell, what you can hear, what you can see. Mm -hmm. So by then having the students live the text or the video themselves, and obviously every experience will be different, they will be much more engaged in it and that will take the information to their long-term memory. That's and excellent. that's everyone. Yeah. That's not just SEN students. Doing that first and then you might you know be using the text or the video for whatever grammar point or vocabulary yeah that I would argue that comes afterwards okay and have you come across any particularly good resources that you've used or maybe something you've written yourself <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> can you feel my blush over the, over the vocal cords um, <laughs> So I've personally been uh, working on a dyslexia-friendly series for ELT um, course, which has been done with Delta, and it's called Bloggers. So it's based on uh, a series of video blogs okay. uh, by teenagers, so it's obviously aimed at teenagers, um, implementing as many creative and inclusive practices as possible yeah um to you know really make everything fun not only for the learner but for the teacher as well so it's from levels a1 to b1 mm -hmm. and it's from ages 12 to 15 16. okay great. um i would also uh recommend actually a recent book I bought, um, so it's edited by um, Margaret Smith, who is actually has been for quite a long time creating um, materials for dyslexic, but also all SEN students. She's also a dyslexia assessor, okay. um, and she said a really good tip that she told me the other day in a, uh, a panel discussion we were having, and it's just a good takeaway tip for teachers: if you suspect one of your students to perhaps have a, a processing uh, obstacle, then, fun enough, uh, take them take them into another room or something and ask them to say the months of the year in order and then say them backwards. Yeah, okay. If they really struggle with that, that's quite a key indicator that there is an issue. So that was a really good takeaway thing. Mm -hmm. But she's recently um, created activities for inclusive language teaching and they're really, really fun. Perfect. I really like them. I would also say, um, there's a new website that I'm really, really into, and it's called Super Deville, and it's again aimed at young, late primary ages, and it's kind of uh, it's short videos, and every child actor, so they're all children acting. All the children actors are SEN students themselves, oh, um, and the videos are all about obstacles that SEN and students face so there was a really cool one where they you know uh were, one of the kids was uh, uh like dressed up as like einstein uh in the laboratory with things <laughs> exploding left and right and center um and she you know she takes two jelly brains um and you know like pokes them they wobble the same they smell the same she pours on chemicals they both explode the same and one of them is a dyslexic brain and one of them isn't. And okay. it's just showing students that our brains are the same. Yeah. They just work in different ways. Yeah. I've actually just sat and watched them all. Um, <laughs> and they all come with um, lesson plans. And I think it's a really good thing to show all students. Definitely. Because it's things that I think, I think you watched the recent webinar the other day, you know, how privilege is essentially something it means that it's someone who hasn't had the difficulties that someone else has. Yeah. So exactly. if you are unfortunate enough not to be neurodiverse, mm -hmm. um, then you are in a privileged position because 
the educational system generally works for you yeah um, and it doesn't for others and i think the only way to make change is to make everyone aware of this and exactly. so videos like these that are aimed at these young generations and realizing that everyone is as important as everyone else and actually these neurodiverse learners are super fantastic exactly. um, with super skills you know things that almost seem superpowers to me you know my husband will say things and make connections that i just think is unbelievable <laughs> and having you know these skills that are go, work very well with the digital world um, we could actually learn a lot from them i think it would be um, good to um get a list together of some of the websites and the, the books that you oh, talked yes. about so we can get that out for for anyone who wants to sort of read further or delve, delve further into this and learn more themselves about it as well so we've got one more final question for you before we let you go. So it was actually sent in from a materials writer that I spoke to just before this session. Um, it's a bit of a tricky one, but um, let's see. So how can writers and teachers develop more inclusive assessments? So would you suggest something like task-based learning or, or maybe project-based assessment where possible? Yeah, so for materials writers and teachers, essentially. Fantastic question. So whether it's giving your students the option to record themselves giving an answer orally rather than writing it down okay um it is an option and um, so obviously as a materials writer you you would just you know put that into the book another option is yeah um yeah. to do x y and z is that um, an extension like potentially yeah, yeah like a teacher's book or exactly something. extension yeah. digital option mm -hmm. You might find that lots of the uh, students are jealous of the ones who get to do it. <laughs> um, Project-based, absolutely. Um, the fantastic thing about projects is that not only is it step by step, um, so they've got you know students uh, students are gradually building a you know a project together. Uh, it, there's less time pressure. Time pressure can often be a real big issue uh, in basically creating blockages in the processing brain. Okay. Um, so unfortunately, then the results suggest one thing, um, whereas actually the reality is something different, which is why you will get extra exam time for some students. Um, um, you know, obviously you can give students progress tests to do at home. If it's digital, the answer, you know, they'll get the, the score straight away and the teacher doesn't have to do anything. Actually, I was talking to someone who's doing a research project for a master's in Birmingham and he was saying that uh, he, he's been sending out surveys to materials writers and teachers um, and he found that teachers who have been teaching for longer mark their confidence in evaluating and assessing students as much lower. Okay. Um, and that could, I, I would imagine, comes from maturity often the more you know about something the more you realize how little you know exactly about it. yeah exactly and i feel like that was speaking to you today <laughs> <laughs> as as a teacher i think i realized that um a lot of different countries and cultures like maybe don't um offer some of the tests that you were talking about at the beginning maybe primary school mm. age or, or maybe dyslexia and, and special educational needs in general is maybe not spoken about in certain cultures as much as maybe we do here oh. in the uk um, Absolutely. But yeah, there's a, there's a, I've learned a lot to um, consider when writing my own materials as well. So <laughs> yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Thank you. I think, yeah, the main thing is just to remember as a teacher, you know, your students might not know, their culture might not accept something. So the, the more fun and creative you can make the classroom for yourselves and for your learners, you're onto a winner, um, whatever. And remember, it's bit by bit no one will ever do anything perfectly so just give it a go exactly and we'll get um some of the books that you mentioned as well and the links to the websites as well so um yeah people can do further reading and further learning and um, getting to know Fantastic. what we're speaking about thanks so much for your time laura it's been so great speaking to you thank you very much for having me thank you speak to you guys take care bye bye once again thanks so much to our guest speaker laura broadbent speaking about special educational needs for the first in our mini series on diversity and inclusion. Thanks so much everyone for listening. Bye bye.